Good morning, how is everyone? Yeah, yeah, that's what I like to hear. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to the PSC team for having us. I'm very excited to talk about our topic today. DAOs are one of my favorite things to talk about and I think staff feels the same way. Um, but basically, if you are a power of a DAO, this talk is for you. Because this question here, what can DAOs learn from? I think it's something we all need to think about a lot more within the context of DAOs and also outside of Web3. What are other non-Web3 entities that DAOs can learn from to be more effective? And so now we're gonna hop into introductions. My name is Madison, I'm one of the co-founders of DreamDAO and I'm from the US. And I'm Saf, uh, I'm a co-steward of DreamDAO and I'm from Vancouver, Canada. And uh, in today's talk, I'm gonna give you all a brief intro to DreamDAO, as well as DAOs in general. And this will hopefully paint some, uh, help paint some context on to some of the things that we'll talk about later on in the talk. Um, Madison's going to spark some inspiration with some case studies, and then we'll give you an opportunity to same, share some of your thoughts as well. So at DreamDAO, we train Gen Z to use Web3 for good. We work with impact-minded Gen Z youth, and uh, I promise you these are some of the brightest kids you'll ever meet. Um, and we equip them with tools and resources to leverage Web3 in creating the impact that they want to create in the world. And we do this in three main ways. Uh, the first of which is through educational sessions. Um, we uh, host a series of talks called Learning Together Sessions with Web3 leaders. Um, past speakers for, for the series have included Aya Miyaguchi from EF, who you all heard speak yesterday at the opening ceremony, as well as Kevin Owaki from Gitcoin. And we're always looking for speakers um, and educators, so if, that's, if you have a topic on Web3 and social impact that you're excited to speak about, definitely reach out to us. Um, we also have a one-on-one -on -one mentorship program um, where we connect our builders with established mentors in the space. And second, we also uh, host what we call an explorers program, where twice a year we run 12-week internships um, uh, so just giving our brightest builders the opportunity to practice what they've learned through our Learning Together sessions. Um, and last but not least, we also sponsor builders to attend IRL gatherings such as this one. So over there, um, you can see a group of our, our builders um, who are uh, learning, making connections, and just making the most of everything that you get out of IRL gatherings. And we do all this as a DAO. We have, um, yeah, we have NFTs, governance, Discord, um, all the things that you'd expect from any other DAO because we truly believe in this model. The ultimate vision of DAOs promises us better ways to organize humans from our workplaces to our social communities. But the truth is we're just scratching the surface of uh, discovering how to optimally structure and operate DAOs. Many processes that are more democratic, decentralized, et cetera, uh, may sound good on paper, but the truth is they prove to be impractical in practice for one reason or another. As a result, many DAOs are not serving their mission or members as effectively as they could be. But the good news is we don't have to reinvent everything. We're solving human problems, problems that we've grappled with for millennia. Often we're too uh, quick to scoff at what we call the Web 2 way of doing things, um, but the truth is that many of these Web2 solutions exist because they work. They've been researched and iterated on for way longer than DAOs have been around, and we shouldn't shrug off their lessons as if we're above them. And it's not all tech either. We often get so lost in the latest tooling or the shiny new frameworks or models that we forget that what coordination comes down to in the end is the human element. So we can choose to learn from our past mistakes instead of repeating them. And now we'll pass it over to Madison to show us how to do this. Thank you, Saf. Okay, now we're going to get into the tangible examples. So <laughs> thank you for staying to that introduction. Um, so the first thing is we're here telling you about like that you should learn from other entities besides Web3 DAOs. Um, so what have we learned from? The first example is Civics Unplugged, which is actually our parent organization. So 
Civics Unplugged trains young people to be civic innovators, so basically people who solve civic and social problems in more innovative ways. Um, and it was basically an off-chain DAO before they even knew DAOs existed. So if you look at some of the design choices here, there is an elected steering committee with a treasury that they get to control. Uh, there, the community votes on youth-led projects that they want to fund. And there are subgroups that work on responsibilities like social media and international student experience. So basically like working groups. And so the co-founders of DreamDAO were also really involved in Civics Unplugged and were able to take a lot of the principles and design choices and experiences to inform how we run DreamDAO today. Okay, so the first non-Web3 case study is Boy Scouts. So if you're from the US, you probably know what Boy Scouts is. But for those of you who don't, the Boy Scouts of America is one of the largest youth organizations in the United States with about 1.2 million youth participants. And I think there's a lot to learn from Boy Scouts in terms of recruiting and retaining young people, and honestly, just people in general. The two core design choices uh, is the first one is recruitment. So the first thing that they do is they recruit from existing values aligned organizations. So you can become a Boy Scout, I believe it's at 10 years old, but they have Cub Scouts for younger boys. And so they recruit from that organization and it's a direct pipeline. So that's kind of how we at DreamDAO do it. We have Civics Unplugged as a parent organization and there's a recruitment pipeline. But this also applies to DAOs who don't have parent organizations or direct affiliations because you can find organizations that are aligned with what you do and have members who wouldn't find your community otherwise. So for example, at DreamDAO, we look for non-technical people who are interested in using Web3 for good. They probably wouldn't find a DAO you know, without Civics Unplugged. And so we recruit directly from the fellowship. The second part is a strong emphasis on word of mouth recruitment. I think that DAOs can do a lot better job of emphasizing this piece because what you can do is actually encourage your members to recruit by word of mouth, um, but also give them the tools they need to do so. Um, give them the tools to share about what the DAO is, how they can join, and other tools like that, because that's one of the biggest methods that Boy Scouts use to recruit people. The second is gamification. So for Boy Scouts, the, the, the goals are clear. The highest level you can achieve is an Eagle Scout. There are a variety of requirements like having a certain number of badges, leadership experiences, and recommendations. And while there may not be a direct equivalent in DAOs, the principle is still the same. Make the goals clear and make it clear what people can achieve in your DAO because that makes them want to stay and it gives them something to work towards. The second is badges to reward small steps along the way. So the Boy Scouts model is actually what directly inspired our merit system at DreamDAO. We've developed our, our own entire merit system that we're about to finish in the next month or so. But basically the way that we're doing it is on-chain Boy Scout badges for the purpose of incentivizing and recognizing activity. So basically the problem right now is like, when I say I'm a member of DreamDAO, that doesn't mean much to you because I could be the most involved person or the least involved person. But something like merit badges gives context to people internally and externally about what level of involvement a member has. So for elections, if I'm going to vote for someone, I can see how much they've been involved and exactly how they contributed. And if I'm putting DreamDAO on my resume, I get to show that I'm a very involved member. Okay, number two is parks. So I actually haven't heard this really talked about in the context of DAOs, so I thought it was a good case study to include. But actually public parks are, uh, the, the foundation of public park design and construction is community involvement and gaining consensus. So the first part of that is master plans. So every park that is created creates a detailed plan for how the park will be developed and constructed, along with how the community is involved in the design process. So this serves as a blueprint for others that they can learn from, you know, like an open source document. And at DreamDAO, we're actually going to be creating a master plan of our own, like a 30 page document, something like that, maybe not that long, of all of our governance structures, the ones that we've really liked, the ones that we see improvement on, and some of our other design choices, 
because we believe that for the DAO ecosystem to make some of these strides and how we can better optimize, how we can better structure DAOs and like optimally uh, just make them function, we need to learn from each other's mistakes and documentation is a really powerful way to do that. Um, the next is the spokes council model. So this is not exclusive to parks, but a lot of parks use this model. Essentially the way it works is there are representatives of different groups. So think for parks, like there's a representative from the police department, uh, a boy scout, uh, teachers, etc. And these representatives meet in a larger group to discuss their individual context and make decisions that would be too high level for any one group to decide on their own. So the way we do that is DreamDAO is we have a DAO council that consists of the leads of each of our working groups. So once a month we meet to talk about issues that would be too high level for any one working group to make the best decision about. Um, and the last is existing for users. So it's actually really, really impressive what parks do to understand and build for their users. If you look at some of these master plans, they have like extensive tables about like what are each of the facilities, who are the users, why do they use them, and parks exist to make sure that the people in the community are enjoying the facility, right? So they build things specifically based on like if they have like, you know, the spokes council, what the teacher says that they want, uh, what the Boy Scout says the needs are for the park. And so they exist for the user and every park is different because of that. Okay, so our last case study is eco-villages. So you may or may not have heard of eco-villages before, but those of you who have not, they are small, sustainable, physical, and co-living communities with their own work, currency, school, and more. I will say not all of them have their own currency or school or work. They all vary a lot, but the general principle is they're their own self-sustaining communities in a physical space. The first lesson to learn from eco-villages is their small size. So eco-villages range from 50 to 250 individuals because with any more, it's hard to form a strong community. And I get very disappointed when I see DAOs blindly follow the metric of how many people are in it. Um, because if you just think about it logically, like if you have 10,000 people that you have a light touch impact on versus 50 people that you have a high touch impact on, like what is the better long-term result? And so I think what can be learned from eco-villages is that oftentimes in eco-villages, people depend on each other for survival. And so it's important to have a strong sense of community. And I think if DAOs also want to have a strong sense of community, they need to learn from that. It's important to have a small size. Um, okay, the second one is work and play. So residents of eco-villages have a lot of formal structure to keep it running because obviously, like I said, they really depend on each other. But they have an equal emphasis on community. Work and play are interdependent. So it's not just a transactional experience of like, we're going to make sure that you have food and you have shelter and everything. They need to make sure that they have a community. And I think it's the same for DAOs because without play, I think DAOs are the 2.0 of Web2 because, I mean, that's true for a lot of reasons, but the main thing is that unlike in Web2 companies, people are voluntarily coming to DAOs and don't have a strong reason to say if they don't have a strong sense of community and they don't feel valued in the space. Um, the third one is making money. So I will say that eco-villages are still figuring this out too, much like DAOs. But something that eco-villages do because often they can't export things because of a lack of resources or physical isolation, they profit off of information. So some make money off of providing education and consulting services to outsiders about living in eco-villages. And so similar to DAOs, I think if you have not figured out a revenue model outside of grants like us at DreamDAO, then, and you can't export a product, maybe consider information. So the master plan that I mentioned earlier that DreamDAO is creating, we're considering doing it as a mirror post as a way to raise funds for DreamDAO. Um, but of course, we haven't figured out a super structured model. So would love if you have any ideas after as well. But I think the core takeaway from that is like, what are some innovations and information that you can provide as a way to gain revenue for your DAO? And we'll close it off with a call to action. Um, what are some steps that you can start taking today to encourage a culture of learning and sharing within your teams? One, look at examples of other DAOs in the Web3 space, as well as other structures outside of Web3, and be open to learning and evolving. 
And two, let others learn from you. Um, share and document everything. This is so important. We can only move forward in this next iteration of the internet and human coordination if we all work on this together. And now, it's your turn. What are some examples and case studies that you know of, or even bolder, mistakes that you've made that we can all learn from? So, open questions. Well, we wanted to ask, we wanted to ask the question of like, what are some other examples you've learned from that we didn't include? Um, I, I was late, so I didn't hear like all the talk, but more than, um, more than example, I want you to ask, like, since you've done that, that the, the research, how do you think that I can create like a community of people that are interested in, um, in know or learn about blockchain in a college? Oh, in a college? Yeah. Interesting. Like students. Yeah. Um, so I would say, um, are, so are you, are you trying to, what kind of people are you trying to target? Like what kind of students or just students in general? Uh, I mean, right now uh, it's uh, software engineer and economic uh, students, but I want to like target uh, mainstream people and uh, the ones that aren't like into uh, speculation and trading to stay, right? I, I want people that uh, are into that technology, not into speculation. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so I, I don't know, Saf, if you have something to say, but I would say, did you see the Boy Scouts example that we gave? No, I wasn't. Okay, <laughs> okay, yeah. So I think the Boy Scouts example is a good one for me to learn from in this case because what Boy Scouts does to recruit people is they have a direct pipeline from an existing organization, and that's what we actually do as well. So I think the principle there is like, if you don't know how to get people to just come to your club naturally or your community naturally, and they wouldn't find the application on their own, what you can do is you can find organizations that have the types of people you're targeting and collaborate with them in like a partnership to get people to like your community. So like if you're targeting like software engineers, maybe like at a college there's like a technical club for like software engineers or something like that. Or if you're targeting non-technical people like we do, Maybe there's some like social impact oriented clubs that you could talk to and have like, and there's like more design choice to talk about from that point of like, if you have live conversations or if you just like share information like, hey, here's the application. But I think generally, if you're targeting people who you think it might be hard to get them to your community, you need to have a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversation and community building to be like, this is not as scary as it sounds <laughs> and, and you can do it and we'll be there to help you. Yeah, no, that's great. The only thing I would add to that is just like, I mean, uh, I'm assuming, but looking at you, you might be a college student who's um, interested in blockchain outside of speculation. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, so just like think about what got you interested in this space? Like what, what brought you here? And like what are some of the things um, that you wish you had as in a community that would have um, helped you be more excited about this earlier on? So yeah, just like think about who you're targeting. Um, you know, what, what's in it for them? Why, why would they be interested in something like this? Um, and yeah, just like make it interesting. Um, just think about what would make it interesting for you. So, yeah. Thank you. Any other? Hi. Uh, so I'll share a mistake that I've made in, in uh, my project. So I'm trying to onboard my community to Web3 through social and environmental impact. And so it consists of beach cleanups and dives against debris and different activities like that. And to me, it made sense. So I started organizing on Sundays. And the community response was, Carlos, that's my only day off. And why is it at 7 AM? <laughs> so there's incentives for people to join. And it, I haven't fully figured out the solution. But something that definitely helped was, instead of me proposing this thing that made sense to me was, OK, you tell me what works best for you, right? And so a lot of them said, well, I'm down for Friday after work. Like at sunset, we do something, you know? So um, still trying to gamify it a little bit more and make it more fun. So that's just my mistake. As yeah. long as beers are involved. <laughs> something that I think is almost impossible to solve is the time zone problem. So like we are an international community with people from like West Coast, East Coast, India, Italy, Russia, that's everywhere, right? Um, and so we've had a very hard time and we haven't figured it out. Like the learning sessions that Saf mentioned, we did a survey to try and figure out what would be the best time for everyone. 
And there was absolutely no consensus. <laughs> it was like completely spread out. And so like what we do is like for important calls, we host like multiple, like if it's like a really important call, we'll host it like two times or something like that. But we're really still trying to figure that out. I don't know if it can be figured out, but yeah, we're thinking about that too. Thank you, Carlos. Anyone else have any? I'm coming to you, I'm coming. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you for the presentation and congratulations for the project. Um, so uh, we've been doing a project in Chetumal in Mexico. Uh, it's very interesting to see that you brought up the example of the parks. And a couple of years ago, like in 2018, 19, we tried creating a local urban DAOs in the city of Chetumal so people could organize themselves. And um, we have a lot of parks there that nobody's using because they're full of drug addicts and trash. And uh, well, we tried teaching people how they can organize. And um, we, what we learned was that we went through a creation phase where we taught people how to do things. And we made a big mistake because we were like, oh, this, everything works, so we can just leave and you're gonna be fine. You, can, you know how to organize. Um, what we learned was that there is a creation phase and there is a consolidation phase. So, um, well, everything stopped the moment we went away from Chetumal. And now we went back uh, to consolidate what we are doing. So uh, this was our mistake. That's why I wanted to share it. And uh, now we are taking a five-year um, trip in a school bus throughout Latin America to teach local people how to use Web3 tools and we are taking care of the creation phase and of the consolidation phase. So I just wanted to share this and yeah, mm -hmm. congratulations again. Thank you for sharing. I, I wanted to ask a follow-up question. What did you mean by you stopped? I don't think I understood. Uh, we had to go away. So we, went, we moved to Europe from Mexico for a um, master uh, degree. And uh, the people were like, they, they just got overwhelmed and the, j everything stopped. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. Anybody else want to share? If not, oh, we have one more. Chris, one of our fearless leaders. Hi. Um, I guess I just have one question. I think, like, being in the space, one thing I've always noticed is that several DAOs go through different leaders coming in and out, different community members coming in and out. So how do you uh, sort of, one, think ahead of that situation and make sure, like, the DAO can sustain uh, without the people, you know, leaving immediately. Uh, so, like, what are the things you're doing to kind of, like, get ahead of that or make sure, like, you have a solid foundation? Yep, I think that's a great question. I think two things that come to mind for me is, one, information, and then, two, just... Um, making people feel like they are able to step up. So on the information point, I mentioned the master plan that we're going to be creating of like all of our governance structures and how the DAO works. That will be useful to people inside the DAO, but also people outside the DAO. So there's never any questions about like, okay, how do we, I don't know, onboard our mentors or something like that. Someone can always pick up the process because it's open source. And the second is, even if you do have the right structures for like elections and like a system that makes sense, if you don't have people who feel like they can step up, that's not gonna work. And so what we try to do is embed leadership opportunities into every part of the DAO. So the example for that us would be, we have working groups and they're all led by <laughs> young people. Uh, so we have a Roth who leads our community working group and Joshua who leads our gatherings working group and we have a couple others as well. So, and, then, and that also applies to like smaller opportunities like bounties, so people can like take bounties at, at any point. Um, and so eventually we could see ourselves doing a structure where we have one of our builders be elected to lead with one of our mentors, uh, lead the DAO. And so that's only going to be the case though if they feel comfortable and they have the experience. And so we're baking those experiences into every level of the DAO. That's great. <laughs> Amazing, thank you. Anybody else have anything to share about their DAO experiences? Oh, I'm coming. Maybe maybe a way to get revenue would be to make like the digital, digital twin, meaning a DAO, mm -hmm. of current uh, organizations like the one, it's your parent company. Mm -hmm. So if you develop the knowledge, not only the information, but the knowledge, and kind of do the uh, design, implementation uh, for another organization, 
that would be kind of some some revenue. Yeah, like, are you saying like providing some knowledge on like some of the things that we've learned to other organizations who are like wanting yeah. to start a DAO? From, from the normal world, like, uh, like Boy Scouts, like going to all these places and developing the digital twin. Yeah, like so helping organizations start their DAO. Yeah, I think that that's an interesting concept. What do you think about that, Seth? Yeah, I, I mean, I think this is, uh, I was too concentrated on my own portions of the talk, so I wasn't paying attention to you, but. <laughs> um, I think you mentioned right at the end, like we're working on a, uh, uh, a playbook um, for, for DAOs that kind of like includes all the learnings from um, how we built DreamDAO. Um, and one of the thoughts that we were just talking about this morning, literally as we were thinking about this talk, um, is uh, like how, um, how can we sort of like monetize that or make that a, um, so we were thinking we could publish such a playbook on Mirror, which is sort of like this decentralized publishing platform um, that uh, up, uh, allows it so that anyone can see. We don't want to like, um, token gate or like we want to like make sure like these learnings are truly open source but um, people can choose to then donate and like buy editions of this playbook um, if they feel like they've gotten value out of it um, so yeah that's one way that we're looking at um, at monetizing the work that we're doing that's great and that's monetizing the information but maybe doing uh, uh, further like helping them to build it would be another way and you will be helping to build valuable things. Yeah, absolutely. So, kind of like a consulting service? Yeah, okay, yeah. Thank you.